I am, I'm very excited to be here today. This is like coming home for us. And so uh, before we get into the message, if you'll just indulge me for a little bit and just say, I want to say thank you. Uh, I know a lot of you are brand new faces. If you've never seen us before, would you raise your hand just so I can get a good, yeah. You're like, who in the world is this big guy? I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Bobby, you've seen me before. Don't raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and the, the rest of you guys, of course, we consider you family. This is first 10 years of our ministry coming out of college was spent right here, and uh, just a, a joyful time in our life. Um, we had two boys. Uh, they both are, were born right here in Wichita, and so uh, that was the beginnings of our little family, and it's hard to believe I was 22 years old. I think about, now I have an 18-year-old, believe it or not. My son Riley is going to be, he's a senior. He's, he just turned 18 about a month and a half ago. So I hope that makes some of you feel really, really old, okay? Um, because it does me. And, and I think to myself, okay, so I was 22 when I set on this adventure of driving back and forth from Springfield, Missouri to here uh, every weekend. And, and my son is now less than four years away from that possibility, and, and it scares me to death because I, I, I just, I, I, I can't see him doing that. I mean, has, does anybody else relate as a parent? You're just like, what in the world? Why did my parents not warn me, you know, to, 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 to not do this or what? But you never know what God's going to do in somebody's life, do you? And, and so we have an 18-year-old. He's a senior. He's going to be graduating this May. And we have our youngest son, Brady, who is now a freshman in high school. And uh, it's just uh, crazy to think about, you know. Um, how time flies. And so we are very thankful for our family here at Glenville. And it's hard to believe it took 10 years to get us back, all right? So, but this January will mark 10 years from, from the time that we had moved to Ohio, and we were there for five years. And then uh, our, the pastor that we were with was called to be the president of the college that I now work for, and he asked me to come alongside of him and lead that school. And so now we've been in Springfield, Missouri, which is my alma mater, uh, for almost five years. So, uh, it's, a, it's an amazing thing when you think about how God moves you and, and, and you're just willing to, to be open to his leading, uh, the places he takes you. Oh, the places you go, right? That's a, a little child's book, I think, from Dr. Seuss, right? Uh, so that's the adventure of, of my, my life and my beautiful wife, Rochelle. Um, she is able to travel with me. We go all over the, the world sometimes, and, and it's just amazing to see the opportunities that have been brought our way. And it really, uh, it's sincerely all started here. And if you look around the room, what do you see? Hmm? Yeah, you see flags. Uh, that demonstrates the fact that this church has an impact around the world. Through missionaries, through uh, things that you give to, the things that you're involved with, and even those that have been a part of this church and now are out doing things. And that's us. That's a big part of who we are. And so we thank you. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the drama that you just saw, okay? Um, and we're, we're going to talk about prison, all right? Um, we're continuing the series that you've been in about the chain breaker, the one who breaks the chains in our life, the one who um, is able to set the captives free. And so we're continuing this series, and we're going to talk today about the prison. Um, maybe some of us find ourselves in some sort of prison. <laughs> it's a little bit different than being chained. Prison is, is a big room, isn't it? Um, how many of you know someone, or maybe even you've experienced prison? Maybe you know somebody that has been in prison, raise your hand, or, or maybe you've visited prison. Uh, prison is not necessarily known as something that is a, a great place to be. Whenever a person has to go to prison, it's because there is a required punishment. Prison is known as a, a method to, to correct some wrongs in people's lives, correct their behavior. And, and sometimes the hope is that, hey, if they, if they go to prison and then when they, they experience prison and then they're there for a little while, then when they get out of prison, then maybe they will be on a right track to help correct things that are in their life. And, and, and maybe serving their time or, or getting a pardon will, will help this person as they move along in life. Here's some interesting statistics here. This was captured... Uh, a few years ago, uh, 
by the Department of Justice. I just look at this and I think, wow, that's, this is crazy. This is a, a chart that, that shows you those who spend time in prison um, if there's a repeat offense and if they have to go to prison again. 37% of those that spend six months in jail usually repeat. And they get back, they get thrown back in jail. 57% of those who spend a year in jail get put back in jail. 68%, and it just grows from there, three years, 68% of them, five years, 77%. And so if we think about this, it's, it's sometimes we, we get this, this, this feeling of, man, if, if somebody's in, in prison, I mean, will they, are they really going to correct their life? Are they really going to change things in their life? Are, are things going to be different? And we have a, a tendency to judge those that are around us that have actually served time. We wonder if it's been a long enough. We, we wonder if they've learned from their mistakes. We wonder really how much good is that time in prison? How much time, how, how much good is that done for that person? Now, if you were to look around you today, you look at the faces of those that are sitting beside you in the rows that are, that are laid out in this room. Believe it or not, every single person in this room has been to prison. Every one of us have been to the big house. Every one of us have been to jail. We've been entrapped, imprisoned, jailed by something that has happened to us, by something that we've done, by someone else in our life. And this, this prison, this jail that we talk about is not a physical prison, but it's a prison of the heart. Something that the physical eye can't see. Let's see if these sound familiar to you. The prison of addiction, of jealousy, the prison of selfishness, pride, lust, chaos. Here's one that I struggle with, the prison of busyness, <laughs> self-worth, hate, the prison of defeat, the prison of guilt, the prison of pain, the prison of, of, of hidden agendas, the prison of the mind. And, and sometimes we find ourselves in these prisons and, and we, we don't like to admit that we are actually in a prison. But yet sometimes we find comfort in those walls. Sometimes we find contentment in the prison that Sometimes we have actually built ourselves. This past week, I was in Guatemala. And I was there for a missions trip. And, and Neil's got some pictures we're going to scroll through here. And I, I was just moved. Every time I go on a missions trip, you saw a lot of the pictures of, of, of our time here at Glenville. And that was a big part of, of what I, I got to experience was going out and seeing what God was doing around the world. And we got to Guatemala on Monday and on Tuesday, we visited this place called The Dump. And Guatemala is a, is a, is a, a poor country, um, very diverse in the classes of people. If you're rich, you're really rich. And if you're poor, you are dirt poor. So we, vid we, we visited this place called The Dump. And I don't know if you can see this or not, but there are birds flying above The Dump. And this dump is a place where all of the trash from the city of Guatemala City is dumped in one location. And these trucks come from all over the city and they dump this trash. And then there are people that live right outside the walls of the dump that live as squatters in these villages. And their job is to, they're allowed to go into the dump during the day they pay off the truck that is bringing the garbage with a small um, price. And then they have free reign to get whatever comes off that truck. And so if you were to look at it, and it's hard to see because it's a small, it's a, it's a picture that is it's giving you a vast picture of all that. But 
There are literally 30,000 people that work that dump. They come in, they gather what they can, they find the food that, they, that their family is to eat that day, and then they go home. There was this one young man that we, we encountered while we were over there, and we asked him, just like we would in the U.S., I mean, he's about 16 years old. He's the age of my kids. We asked him, hey, what, what are you, because I mean, we're trying to wrap our minds around this idea of this is where they live, eat, and breathe. We said, hey, man, what, what's the deal? What, what, what do you want to see in your life? What are you hoping to accomplish? What do you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And this 16-year-old boy said this. I'm trapped. I live in the trash. I work in the trash. I eat the trash. I am the trash. Talk about living in a prison of your mind and your heart. You know, all of us live in a prison, and maybe, maybe not right now, but we have experienced that. And, and, and you know what? Just like this drama showed us, all of us are guilty, and some of us have been in a prison for a very long time. And some of us are very comfortable in our prison, but, but if we were to see the freedom that, that God brings to us by, by breaking down those prison walls, we would be screaming for release, let me out, let me out. So today we're going to look at a few prisons of our heart and our mind. Today we're going to kind of break these down, and, and we're going to look at it from the perspective of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. And this is what it says in Hebrews 12, 1. Uh, we're, sur- we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. There's, there's lots of, of Christians around, right? There's, there's, a, there's a great cloud, and some would interpret this to be even those that have gone before us. And we're running this race called Christianity. We're, we're living our life for God. But then it says this, Let us also lay aside every weight and sin. Now, it's not talking about our physical weight. It's talking about weights that come upon our life that weigh us down. It's talking about sin in our life that, that, that may entrap us. And here's the, this is my favorite part of this verse. The next four words. Which clings so closely. You see, every single person has something that they are dealing with. Every person in this room, every person in this world has weights and sin that weigh us down. And sometimes we hold that sin and that weight so closely it becomes a part of who we are. They imprison us. And so we're going to look at a couple prisons today and then we're going to look at what Jesus has done for us and be done. Number one, we're going to look at the prison of sin. The prison of sin affects us all. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, and if you have been a part of this church for any time, uh, amount of time, I'm sure that you have heard or know this verse. It says, for all have sinned. Not one person can escape the penalty of sin. Not one person can release themselves from the prison of sin. We've all fallen short of God's glory and the the standard that he has given to us. And so sometimes we get a skewed view of that in our world. Sometimes we realize, oh, you know, I'm probably good enough. I'm I'm probably, uh, I'm going to be fine. I'm a good person. And so we find this story in Acts chapter 8 of of a guy that kind of had that same mentality. He thought he was doing really good. His name was Simon, and he was Simon the Magician. And Simon the Magician was known because he would do magic uh, and, and do these special things that no other person could do. And, and, he, and people were kind of in awe of this guy named Simon. And, and so then Peter comes along, and he starts to watch from afar God working in Peter's life. And he sees what God is doing in Peter and, and how God is working in Peter to affect others. And he asks Peter, man, is there any way, it's just so crazy, is there any way that I could actually buy what you have, Peter, 
Is there any way that I could just, could I get some money out of my pocket and then could I, could I buy this from you? Whatever this special power, because man, I know special power. I mean, I've, I've got this. And so he is, he's actually not, not even realizing that he's sitting in a prison of sin in his life and he's, he's trying to find a way out and he's asking, man, here is some money, Peter. Let me, let me, just help me and let me buy this from you and you show me the way. And then Peter's like, man, there is no way that you can buy this power. In fact, verse 21 says, you have neither part nor this matter, for your heart is not before God. Verse 22, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you, but you've got to repent. And then he lays it down and he tells old Simon the way it's going to be and who he really is. And this is what he says to him. For I see that you, and he's talking to Simon, are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. I mean, he calls Simon out. He says, Simon, there is no way that you can purchase the power of God. In fact, let me give you a clear picture of really who you are. And I I think he was actually doing this out of love for Simon. And he looks at him and he says, you are in the gall. How many of you guys know what the gall is? This is, it's disgusting. It's the contents of the gallbladder. Everybody say, ew. Yeah. It's the bile. It's bitterness. It's poisonous. He said, man, Simon, you are trapped in this bond of iniquity that is poisonous and you need to come to Christ. And man, it's just like he realizes, I need Jesus in my life, but... But it took a while for him to get to that point because we never want to place guilt upon ourselves. And, and here was Simon trying his best to buy his way out of that prison when all he needed to do was repent. Um, here's a picture of my family. This is uh, Brady in the front and Riley in the back. And they're about the same height now. And that really drives our oldest son crazy. Um, how many parents are out there? Raise your hand if you're a parent. I don't know if it's like this in your house, but in our house, whenever our kids get in trouble, they always want to shift the blame to the other person. <laughs> mm, yeah, there we go. We got some amens now. Yeah. They want to deflect. All I want for my children really is to admit who did the wrong, right? I mean, mom and dads, can I get an amen? Like somebody tell me who did this. I just want to know so we can get this taken care of. But there is a constant fight from our kids to shift the blame to the other person, to, to make the other person bear the weight of that wrong or that sin. And they, they didn't want to lose the approval, and they would never do this, but they didn't want to lose the approval of their father and their love for their parents. And so what happens is you fight for the right to be free, and yet we have the guilt of what we've done. If we're not careful, we'll do the same thing with God. God, it's not me. <laughs> God, I, I didn't do that. God, I, I don't have a sin nature. God, I, I, this is not who I am. And when God is saying, I just want you to come to me and say, you're sorry. I want you to admit your guilt. Isaiah gives us a great picture of what God is and who he is, what he has done in our life. This is Isaiah chapter 61. This is when Isaiah is, is getting ready for the deliverance of the children of Israel, and he's the prophet. He's the guy that's telling these guys about what, what is to come and what God is going to do in their life. And he says this, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring you good news. And they're like, amen, yeah, woo, good news is coming, right? He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. This is what God wants to do for you. He wants to bind your brokenhearted. He, he, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, those that are in captivity, those that are in prison, and then the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Then he goes on and he says, instead of your shame, this is what God wants to do in your life, there shall be double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion, and they shall, they shall have everlasting joy. And then verse 8, for I, the Lord, this is God, love justice. Okay, remember that. He's a just God. He hates wrong. I hate robbery and wrong. But this is who our God is. 
I will faithfully give them recompense or forgiveness. Yes, I'm a just God. Yes, I hate sin, but I will faithfully, when you do something faithfully, you're doing it over and 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 over again. I will faithfully give them forgiveness. A little boy was visiting his grandmother, and they got him his first slingshot. And he was practicing in the backyard, and, and he wasn't very good. He was missing the, the targets all over the place. And one day he saw grandma's pet duck in the backyard. And he thought, you know, I'm not very good, but I might as well try. So he brought that slingshot back, and he aimed for that duck, and he released, and he hit the duck. It's a dead duck. No more duck in the backyard. Well, Johnny got scared. And he decided, well, I, I, I'm going to hide this duck in the wood pile. Nobody will ever know. And as he, ri he rises from the, the, the wood pile from hiding that duck, he turns around and he sees his sister, Sally. But she said nothing. Later on that day, Grandma says, Sally, hey, come on, let's, let's wash the dishes. And Sally says, oh, no, Grandma, Johnny told me he wanted to help in the kitchen today. <laughs> Didn't you, Johnny? She whispers, remember the duck. <laughs> so Johnny did the dishes. Later, Grandpa asked if the children wanted to go fishing, and Grandma said, no, I need Sally to come, and, and she needs to help me get ready for dinner. And Sally says, no, Grandma. I, I'm so happy Johnny said that he wanted to do dinner tonight for all of us. And she whispered again, remember the duck. So Johnny stayed and Sally went fishing. Several days went on of Johnny doing Sally's chores day in and day out. And he finally couldn't take it anymore. And he confessed to Grandma that he had killed the duck. And she said, I know, Johnny. She gave him a hug. She said, I was standing at the window the whole time because I love you, I forgave you. I just wondered how long you would let Sally make a slave of you. It's amazing what the prison of sin will do if we're not careful. The prison of weights. The prison of weights is best described as, as things that we hold on to, things that hold us back from taking the next step in life's journey. It's a little different than the prison of sin this is, this is things that we go through. The events in our life that, that cause struggle in our life. And I think if I was to have you raise your hand, everybody in this room would say, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've seen hard times. I've seen stresses. And it's hard to give up. But these weights become more important to us as time goes on as we live our life. And if we're not careful to release those weights, they become a prison or a shelter for us. And many times we think we're in control of the weights of our life, but yet they begin to control us and our next move. The prison of weights will weigh you down spiritually, mentally, emotionally, so much that you can't move forward. You are just stuck in this prison. And oftentimes these weights are rooted in relationships that have gone wrong, the feelings that have gone bad, Mourning in situations that it's just too hard to get over. Loneliness, exhaustion, oppression, ailments. And we begin to believe the fact that, man, we are just going to have to do with this for the rest of our life. And, and I'm just going to live in my prison, my fortress of solitude. And sometimes it's my platform to show the world that I've been wronged. Questions arise. Why, God? Why am I going through this? Why did this happen to me? Anger comes, discontentment, confusion, bitterness, and our life is centered in not on what God wants to do with us, but on the weights that we, we bear. Weights are a real thing. In fact, 
the Bible actually shows us some verses in the Bible that describe weights and things that others have gone through. Listen to this, Proverbs 20, I'm sorry, 12, 25. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. Paul in 2 Corinthians writes this at the end of this, of this uh, uh, little uh, of this verse in verse 8. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. I mean, these guys have gone through it, man. You, you may think you're alone, but you're not. And these are great examples for us to look to of people that have faced hard times. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, we see Moses, and this, he's recounting the time when he was the only leader of the children of Israel and he literally said, at that time, I said to you, and he was talking to the, the children in, 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 of Israel and also the leaders, I'm not able to bear this by myself. This weight is too great. So tough times are going to come. Times that don't make sense. Situations that seem unfair. But it's going to be inevitable. Be watching for it be striving for it. And some of us probably are living in that prison. Well, I'm glad we aren't stopping there this morning just to talk about the prisons that we find ourselves in, aren't you? <laughs> some of us may be in a prison of sin. Some of us may be in a prison of weight. But for all of us, there is one who will pardon us from prison. You see, all of us have been there. Some of us may still be there. Some of us may have a prison in our future. But these prisons don't have to hold us captive. I, I love this story in the Bible of one of the most famous prison escapes uh, that we find in Scripture. And that's found in the book of Acts. That's Paul and Silas while they were in prison. If you recount the story, you find out that, that Paul and Silas were kind of minding their own business. They were doing life. They were following God with, with what he wanted them to do. They were seeing people healed. They were just the, the work of the Lord was around them. And there was this young lady who started to follow them. And, and there was something very unique and strange about this young lady. In fact, uh, the Bible tells us that she had a spirit of divination, okay? Or there was something within her that there was a spiritual warfare going on. And she would be able to fortune tell because of this spirit. And so she, she began to follow them around and days went on. And then the Bible says in verse 18 that Paul, um, yeah, Paul began to be annoyed with this person. He's like, all right, enough is enough. And so what does he do? He looks at her and he commands the spirit to come out of her. Well, that caused a little problem with the girl's owner. So immediately, Paul and Silas were seized and were thrown in jail. Now, this is a physical jail. This is not a, a spiritual jail. And, and it tells us in verse 22 that the crowd joined in and started attacking these guys. I mean, picture this, you know, they're, they're being beaten. They're being uh, afflicted with, with different blows from different materials. And then they're thrown in prison, and then they, and then they, are, they are fastened. I mean, if you could think about this in, in, in a spiritual sense of sometimes we go through things in life and, and that we are, we are literally fastened by our hands and our feet spiritually, that we don't know where to go and we don't know where to turn. And they give us a great example of what to do here. In verse 25, it says, Paul and Silas started complaining to each other. No, it doesn't. It says, Paul and Silas got really, really bitter. No. It says, Paul and Silas started praying and singing. And when that happened, the prison doors were opened and their shackles were released. What a great picture for us today. You may not be in a physical prison like that. You may never see someone who actually is, is, is um, uh, um, going through that kind of prison. I mean, we, and even in today, we treat our prisoners probably better than what they did back then. But if you think of it in a spiritual sense, replace your life with the story of Paul and Silas. You're trying to live for Christ. You're following him. Then all of a sudden, 
It feels like you are being dragged into jail emotionally and spiritually, and, and things are attacking you or around you, and you just feel like you have been beaten up. What do you do? Well, I wish I could say that I have always reacted the way that Paul and Silas gave us this example. But I haven't. But I hope going forward that we can learn from them today. You see, the answer is not in my complaining or my bitterness or my unforgiveness or my mindset. It, the answer is found in one word, and that's Jesus. There is one who knows exactly what you are going through, and I know when I say those words, some of you are going, no, he doesn't know what I've gone through. He does. The Bible says he took upon himself the form of a servant. The Bible says he bore our sins. He, he identified himself with every sin and every weight that entraps you and I. In the prison that you sit in today, I promise you, Jesus knows and understands it all. This is the one who has the power to tear down prison walls, was also a prisoner. The one who can right wrong situations and accusations in your life was wrongly accused. The one who can wipe away guilt was found guilty. The one who knows your sin, he knows your sin. The one who wants to free you of your burdens once took upon the cross the burdens of the world. The one who wants to see the dead in, in your life and the trespasses and sin be wiped clean once died for you. The one who sees you longing for life now lives. The one who sees you sitting and waiting in your prison cell holds the keys of death and hell and the grave and he has the power to set you free. So how do we do this? How do we get out of jail? Well, Jesus has done all he can do. The choice is now yours. The pardoner stands outside of the prison waiting for your next move. But you have to decide to accept his pardon for your life. Just like we saw today, you can either accept or reject. To the person who, who does not know the freedom of Jesus yet, maybe, maybe you're thinking about in your life, man, I, I want to know more about this, or, and maybe I, 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 I'm thinking about asking Christ to come into my life. Just like this man we saw today, you have a choice to make. You see, Jesus is ready to make a pardon on your behalf. The Bible says he's our advocate. He's our savior. And he goes before us. He died for you. He rose again. And he is the one we find true hope and salvation in. So the next move is yours. It's your turn. You see, you can't get out of prison on your own. Just like Simon the magician who wanted to and longed to do that. You can't do it. There's not enough time. There's not enough good that you could do. There's not enough time to be served but there is something you can do, and that's this. Romans 10, 9, and 10 says this. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the breaking down of the prison of sin in your life. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. It's a really easy way to remember this, okay? How do I come to Christ? Number one, you got to admit you're a sinner. It's like ABCs here. Believe in your heart that Jesus died and rose again, and then confess him as your Lord. You know, here's where the prisoner on our stage had a problem. He couldn't get past admitting that he was wrong. So today... Let today be the day where you break free from the bondage of sin and darkness and find hope in Jesus alone. And to the person who knows Christ, 
man, some of us can rejoice and see what God has done in our life. And some of us, man, we're, we might be in a place right now where we just need, we need Jesus to show up. <laughs> we, we need to have a prison-shaken Savior come into our life and, and help us get through the struggles that we're going through, the weights that, that, that bear on us, even the sin that's in our life. And maybe you've accepted Christ. Maybe you know him as your Savior. Maybe you're like, yeah, man, I, I got that part, but I still, I'm building up, I got this prison around me. It's a hard thing to break through. Can I just encourage you today? Make today the day where you do that. Um, for 10 years, I was in a prison. And I finally made the right choices. To seek forgiveness. And to see God do amazing things within my life. But it took. It took me to say, you know what God? I give my life to you and my, my heart. And I pray that you will use me. And just show me what I need to do. So I get it. I get that there are weights and there are sin. I, I've been through it. You're sitting in a room full of ex-cons here, guys. <laughs> we desire to see you seek freedom. 1 Peter 5, 7 says this. Casting all your cares on him because he cares for you. I'm just thankful we have a God that cares for us and that loves us. I'm going to ask you just to bow your heads and close your eyes. I pray today that if you're in a prison, that you realize a couple things. Number one, we've all been there. Number two, Jesus is right outside the door waiting for you to make your move. And number three, it's your choice. It's your choice whether you want to stay in that prison or whether you want to be set free. <laughs>